My name is Father Joseph Matlack, and I would like to welcome you all to Becoming Byzantine, a program co-sponsored by the Byzantine Catholic Eparchy of Phoenix and Vineyard of the Lord Catholic Ministries. And in this program, we are going to walk through the Byzantine Catholic faith, our worship, and our life based upon Christ our Pascha Catechism. Well, understand a little bit more about what that word catechism means. But in this first session, I'm going to talk about the faith of the church, and I'm going to just give you a very basic introduction to the Byzantine catechumenate. And we'll see again what that word uh, catechumenate means. Um, what we're going to do is focus on just a few of those sections, which I list here, uh, paragraph 1, paragraphs 9 to 11, 53 to 54, and 63 to 66, as well as an appendix at the end of the catechism. The catechism it can be actually purchased as a hard copy, or you can actually find it online at catechism.royaldoors.net. So whichever you prefer, whether you want a hard copy or whether you're okay with reading something online, uh, the catechism is available for you online. So what I'm going to do is just dive right into it by talking to you about the first paragraph. And I'm going to read through it and uh, point out anything that's important going forward. I think the first line is very, very important. And if, if all you remember is this, this is really the crux of everything. The source of Christian life is faith in the risen Christ. So St. Paul says this in the New Testament, when he's presenting his faith to all people, he's writing to believers, but it's also valid for all of those looking in uh, to believers to understand what really makes them uh, continue in this life of faith. Well, really, it's the risen Christ. St. Paul teaches, if Christ has not risen, then everything else makes no sense. Really, the fact that Christ has risen from the dead gives us credence, gives us the hope, gives us the drive to do everything that we do and to live this life. And that's especially true in this day and age in our culture, which is beginning to reject a lot of what we believe and a lot of the foundations that we have as Christians and, and in a Christian society or in, in Christendom. But if Christ has risen from the dead, then everything revolves around that. If Christ has risen from the dead, he has conquered everything. And, and that means that we have hope. We have hope that there is a resurrection for us as well, because we belong now to Christ. We are a member of his family. And so the catechism goes on. Now, this faith, this faith in the risen Christ, was formulated by the church in what's called the Nicene Creed, well, also known as the niceno constantinopolitan symbol of faith. And we'll see, you know, a little bit later exactly what that means. And we express that faith in our liturgical prayer. So it's not just a faith that we keep on the inside. We actually express it in prayer. And through that prayer, we actually become partakers of a new life in Christ. So prayer isn't just something that we do begrudgingly. Prayer isn't just something that we do because we have to. Prayer expresses the new life that we Christians believe that we have and that we share in. And then this new life allows us to grow because we participate, we work out in spirit and in our moral efforts, all of the implications behind that life in Christ. And so the catechism goes on and says that the symbol of faith, which summarizes our faith, goes together with one of, you know, you could say the highest form of expression of that prayer, which is the liturgy, the, the Eucharistic liturgy, uh, perhaps the main prayer of which is what's called the anaphora of St. Basil the Great. And again, we'll see a little bit more about what that means. And so the catechism points out that these things, these sources of our faith are going to be the basis for how the catechism will actually proceed. You know, it could have done it in a number of ways, but it shows very specifically to talk about the risen Christ is the center of everything. And our faith is summarized in the creed. The, the prayer, um, the I believe prayer. And then it's also summarized in the liturgy, the sacred liturgy, the, the, the prayer that we, um, that we sing and we celebrate as a community and as a community that has been redeemed, that lives 
um, in the risen Christ now. Okay, so that's the basis of the catechism. So as you go through, just keep that in mind. And so in, in paragraph nine, this is how the catechism is going to be divided. Okay, so it's going to talk about the faith of the church. So it's going to talk a little bit about uh, the, the, our beliefs. It's going to summarize our beliefs. And then sometimes it's going to go into great detail. Um, so, so what we believe and why we believe it. It's going to, it's going to ex uh, expound upon that a little bit. The second part is the prayer of the church. So as we saw already, um, what we believe and why we believe it gets expressed in our prayers. We don't pray something that we don't believe in. It's not, there's not a disconnect there. There is a complete connection. And then at the end of the third section is the life of the church. Okay. So it's how we basically live all of those mysteries out. So what we believe and why we believe it and expressed in our prayer and also expressed in our lives, in our lives. And, uh, Paragraph nine here says that that division reflects the very essence of Christian salvation. So this is how God has worked uh, in and through us with his people. Firstly, he reveals himself to us. He teaches us about himself and also about who we are. And he develops that over, over time, guided by his church. Secondly, that belief is, is lived out in two ways. Firstly, in our prayer and then uh, in, in, in our moral lives, in our living out, because again, we, we, we belong to a, 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 an incarnate, which is a lived faith, an experienced faith, something that's made real in our lives. It's not simply a philosophy, uh, but it's something that we, we do on a day-to-day -day basis. And this is what the church professes, and this is what we're going to see going forward, especially in this, uh, in this overview. Um, so in the first section we saw here, you know, Really, it's the, the, what Christ accomplished, his Passover, his rising from the dead. That's the ground of everything that we believe in. And then, of course, the symbol of faith just expounds upon that based on what God has revealed to us. And in the second part, the liturgical uh, expression of the faith. So Christ, who tells us to, to, to do what he asks us to do. So it's not simply something that we believe. It's something that we live daily, weekly, and yearly. The, and, 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 and what we do in the church, uh, the Byzantine tradition will actually call the holy mysteries. It's the mysteries that we live. And it actually sounds like uh, something that we don't understand. But what it really is, is it's just something that we uh, grasp ever more deeply. The more we do it, the more uh, beautiful and profound and deep it, it will seem to us. And that is what nourishes our spiritual life. It has to be something that's deep. The roots have to go down deep. Um, and so as, as we pray the prayers, it's like an experiential faith, an experienced faith. It's like you're being in a relationship with someone. When you're in a relationship with someone, the more you spend with that person, the more time you spend with that person, the more you know from that person about that person, and the more you can express a response to that person. You know, for example, in, in love, I, I, I love the more that I know, and the more that I know, the more I will express my love and devotion to that person. And so by our faith and by our prayer, what the church celebrates is that we've been filled with grace. We have been sanctified and we are being transformed. And it's not something that just is, takes up part of our lives. It's not simply an hour on Sunday or Christmas or Easter. It's something that really begins to transform us from the inside out because we're described as being filled with grace. We're described as being truly sanctified and truly transformed. And that really is supposed to be something that, that, that is all encompassing. The entire human person is raised up and is transformed by our encounter with God. And that's what causes us to have a, a whole new way of living and a whole new way of thinking. And that's why part three of the catechism then talks about the moral life. You know, that what we believe and how we celebrate impacts how we treat others as well as ourselves in the world. Okay, so let's go back to the beginning. I mentioned that you know, St. Paul said that faith in the risen Christ is really uh, the beginning of everything. St. Paul also says um, that the, the faith that we have has to have been given to us from someone. So yes, Christ rose from the dead, but how do we know that Christ rose from the dead? Well, somebody taught us. And for many of us, uh, we're, we're taught that in infancy by our parents, by our church communities. 
Others of us are learning this perhaps for the first time as an adult. But what really happens is when Christ rises from the dead, the apostles, and you know, later on, Paul, who becomes an apostle, who himself was a persecutor of Christians, becomes an apostle, are so transformed by the experience of the risen Christ that they go out and proclaim that risen Christ to the world. And in Greek, there's a fancy word that they use. It's called the kerygma. So the kerygma is, is, is that initial proclamation of the risen Christ. And eventually from that, as we go deeper in understanding and deeper in teaching the truths of the faith, what we have is what's called catechesis. And again, it's, 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 it's another Greek word. So kerygma is the proclamation of the basic event. Christ was incarnate. Christ died and rose for our salvation. And that reality is really lived in the community that he formed, which is the church. So really, it's that first call. So maybe some of you here are hearing that call for the very first time, that Christ has done this for you. And for, for you, just as much and just as really as he did it 2,000 years ago. And he's calling you to believe in him. Perhaps he's calling you to convert to him. Perhaps he's calling you to follow him, just like he did with those first disciples. But for others, we, we've already you know, come into the church, come into the community, and our faith might need to be deepened. As, and really, the secret is, it's, it's the case for all of us. Our faith can always be deepened. Um, so we're, whether we're at the level of kerygma or we're at the level of catechesis, where we're uh, making our faith deeper, more profound, the fact of the matter is the same mystery applies to all of us. It, it really provi uh, um, applies to all of us. And, and that when, when we live that out, when we become one with that, when that permeates our life, we profess it. We profess it before the nations. It causes like, it's like a, a surge welling up within us. St. Paul even one point describes it. Woe to me if I do not preach that. In essence, he's taking the joy that's in him, the joy that's making him proclaim his faith. So catechesis, for those of you who are already initiated, is just exploring your faith a little bit deeper. Um, and, and, and the kerygma is for those of you who are coming to the faith for the first time. And uh, also there's a third, a, a fancy word, mystagogy. What that basically means is those people who are receiving the mysteries or receiving the sacraments who are deepening their understanding of what they just went through. Okay, so it really is all encompassing. And, and if you look in the scriptures, you'll see examples of this everywhere. But really the goal of it all, okay, is, is what the catechism teaches here. It's to teach and to form people in faith but not just a heady faith, not just an intellectual faith. It's teaching people to really have communion, fellowship with Christ and his community, okay? So it's not something that we do privately in our rooms. Anyone can do anything in theory in that way. But how Christ decided to save us was in communion with him and with his church. And so it's going to be something that will really apply to everyone and to every aspect of everyone's life. It's not something that you can fit into a box uh, over an hour in, in the week. So let's go back to the beginning and see how the church understood catechesis throughout the ages. Well, firstly, it was focused on mostly adults, um, and there were three stages. There was what's called the catechumenate, which was where people learned about the faith. Uh, it, there was the illumination, which is another way of saying, I'm coming out of the darkness and into the light. I'm being baptized, basically. And then I'm initiated. I'm initiated here by chrismation and in, in the Eucharist. So I'm, I'm fully becoming a member of the community. So what happened is a candidate was presented to the community and became a, what's called a catechumen, a Christian in the making, if you will. Um, the, the catechumen would hear the scriptures. Um, and what they would do is since they were not able to take part in the full offering of the community. You know, they were looking forward to it, but they couldn't do it just yet. They took their place in what's called the narthex of the church, which is the outward, the back part of the church, symbolizing the world. They were still in that worldly side, that pre-Christian stage, uh, and they were ready to leave the world, but they weren't yet fully ready to enter into it because what they had to do is they had to learn about the faith. Uh, and in many places in the church, they also had to serve the needs of the poor to understand that our faith really is a lived faith. 
So they would take part in that outside section. Okay? And then eventually, during that time, some places in the church lasting as much as two or three years, uh, they would familiarize themselves with their faith, and with and with good works, you know, taking care of, for example, the needy, the poor, uh, and then what they would do is they would be brought back into the community, and they would be examined on whether they they really did learn the faith. Did they learn the symbol of the faith, the Nicene Creed? Uh, did they learn the Lord, the, you know, the Lord's Prayer? Can they recite that? So, so here in those two prayers, the church is giving us the crux, if you will. Of, of that initial stage of the prayer. It's not the end of prayer, it's just the initial stage. You have to know what you believe in, and you have to know that it's all about communion with your Heavenly Father before you can even go uh, and do anything else. Um, and then they would be brought in and taught by the bishop himself, and then eventually baptized. At the end, they were baptized, um, you know, usually by immersion, being submerged into Christ's death and raised up in his resurrection. So sometimes being immersed three times in the water, which was often the, the, the baptismal font, often shaped like a, a tomb and also a womb to symbolize what we're doing is we're dying to the world uh, and, and being raised up, living in Christ. And after that, they would undergo what's called mystagogy, where they would be taught, this is what you have been through. Uh, because sometimes, you know, we, we, we live those mysteries and we don't really stop to ask, what have I just been through? And then eventually chrismated and received Holy Communion. So what it, what, what, how we begin our baptism really plays into how our churches were built. Um, our churches were built in a way that when you really understood what was going on, it's all about bringing people into the fullness of communion with our Lord. And, and that brightness, that joy that they lived in was a resurrectional joy. Because again, what's the center of our faith? It's the risen Christ. So it was something that was especially done uh, in and around the time of Pascha, which is called now Easter in, in, in Western English speaking Western culture. The garments that those people were clothed in uh, symbolize the fact that they live now a new risen Christ, cleansed, purified, and they rejoice. They rejoice that one day they will rise with Christ. Mm -hmm.